Hey, what's up? This is Gail Greenwood of Belly, and you're listening to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil and spot. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Antiet, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is... Gail Greenwood, bass player for Belly. Yeah, uh, Belly just returned from a uh, fall tour, and they're in the studio yeah, writing... on a new album. Yeah, writing recording it for a new album. What else they got going on? What else does Gail got going on Yeah, here? she's got a, a, a Joey song, Epilepsy Research Benefit, coming up in Madison, Wisconsin in January. Uh, Battle of the Bands, where uh, she's uh, leading a... a the know-it-all girlfriends versus Butch Vig's the know-it-all boyfriends. Yeah. So that'll be a lot of fun, yeah? Yeah. So hey, let's get to that interview. All right. Good night. Good night. Gail, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, Jeff Unty. Gail, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Eric and Jeff. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the correspondence. Thank you for your willingness to participate. We are so excited to have you tonight. We're big Belly fans, so let's get going here. Let's, uh, awesome. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Belly just returned from a tour with the Breeders this past October. Um, how did you feel as though uh, the attendance was for f- fans um, this post COVID-19 era now? Well, we hadn't toured since, um, 2018. So we were supposed to do a bunch of shows in 2020. The goal was once we reformed in 2016 was to try to go out, you know, every two years. And mm-hmm. do. So obviously just like everybody else, we got shut down in 2020. It's been five years since we'd played together as a show. Tanya and I have done a bunch of things together with the Parkington sisters and a bunch of shows here or there. And I have a, my forever love local band, Benny Sizzler, Mm -hmm. Um, We've done some shows, but Belly hadn't done a show since, um, I guess, yeah, it was 2018. Oh, wow. Um, I think Chicago. I think, um, yeah, at the Vic in Chicago was our last show. Oh, wow. So do you go yeah. out, do you go out on, on on the road with more established acts like the Breeders, or or how do you guys go about picking uh, opening acts for you guys? Well, that was interesting because they had um, they were doing their 30th anniversary of their record Last Splash, and um, they were looking for an opener for their West Coast dates. And we actually did the East Coast with our wonderful, beautiful friends, the Parkington Sisters, uh, who are from uh, Wellfleet on the Cape up here in New England. And Tanya has done a whole record with them. Um, and so we had them. They actually played with us on six songs. They opened for us. And they, they're two violins and a keyboard and accordion, uh, Rose, Sarah, and Ariel Parkington. So they, we did an East Coast um, tour with them. for That was like about a week. 
Um, and that was phenomenal. So, you know, basically we had a full orchestra with us and, and uh, we did <laughs> nice. just the big cities. And uh, that was really, really wonderful. And then um, the breeders asked us to come out and open for them on some West Coast dates, just like San Diego, L.A., um, Seattle and San Francisco. So um, we couldn't turn it down. And I've told this story a million times on stage. But even though the, our both of our bands have been together forever and Tanya is a founding member of the breeders mm -hmm. the breeders and belly have never shared uh, a bill before we've oh, never cool. um played on the same stage before yeah. so it was um it was fascinating and amazing and they were great to watch every night they're phenomenal and they did the record last flash to a t yeah. and then um for their eight song encore they brought tanya out and and they did songs off of um pod yeah. which is the first EP that the the breeders put out. So that was really great for people. That was great for me to watch. It was great for fans. Um, our whole band was just like ecstatic. It was just like, it was amazing. It was really great. That's so cool. And you know, you'd spoke about the band hasn't been out on tour since 2018, but for a heritage act like belly, um, is it more yeah. advantageous for, for you, I guess, and the rest of the band when it comes to touring to do these, you know, like one month mini tours type of deal? And, and with that, is it always beneficial to go out with a package deal like somebody like the Breeders, this part of your career? Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, this, that's like, that's only the first time that we, um, not to sound like a douchebag or anything, but we haven't actually um, opened for anybody yeah. in a long time. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm, I'm just is like really 100% douchebag right now. And I don't mean <laughs> the douchebaggery to come across this way. But I mean, essentially, you know, I think the last time we opened for somebody was um, when we toured with REM in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that was back in the 90s. Yeah. Um, you know, the enormous domes and the soccer stadiums. And it was phenomenal. Right. But for the most part, we were the headline of bigger theaters, you know, kind of places that we didn't do a normal zone or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, to be an opener was really interesting. And it was actually very freeing playing uh, on this package with the breeders because um, they were so wonderful. Like I used uh, Josephine Wiggs bass rig. Like, so I didn't even have to fly out with my back line. Mm -hmm. um, or we rented back line from SIR. Um, Kim let Tanya use her amp. Tom used, I think Tom rented an amp from SIR. It was so freeing. Like we literally were just traveling around in a grand wagoneer. Tanya <laughs> is, you know, not only our amazing front person, lyricist, songwriter, singer, but she's also our tour manager, our accountant, our publicist, mm -hmm. our um, uh, production manager, <laughs> you know. So she orders the back line. She orders the, the hotel. She's our travel agent. So it was really succinct, small traveling. We didn't even use a crew. It was just the four of us laughing our asses off driving the entire west coast to get to these shows um so that's a long way of answering your question but um that that was different for us what we did in 2018 and 2016 was we actually opened for ourselves so we did a two-hour set My we God. did one hour belly took like a 20-minute break people could call their babysitters or whatever and then we came <laughs> out and, play, and and played again and that worked out great too because we could do our catalog from our two records and our third record that was out in 2018 so that that was neat too it does make sense financially most of us have other jobs or children i don't have kids but most of us and two two of us in the band have children and other jobs and it's really financially doesn't make sense to go out with a giant crew, a big bus, and the demand isn't there, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Heritage Act wise, maybe it is. The nineties are popular again, so you know, we're enjoying that resurgence and um and we love the nineties too, obviously, but it doesn't make tons of sense financially to do longer tours, mostly to hit the big cities, you know, kind of come in and out. I, I think back in the day you'd do secondary and tertiaries and you'd really work a record. You know, you would You'd be out on the road for a year, mm. um, but sadly, we're making just as much money, you know, than we did back then. Like, because the expenses were so high back right. then, you yeah. know, just because of the amount of production that we traveled with. Yeah. So um, financially, this makes sense, and also like mental health, like it's just really it's fun, right? You know, when you know you're going to be out on the road for a, a year, it's it can get 
sad and depressing. But when you know that you're going to be home in two weeks, it's really fun and wonderful. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, because we've talked to some mm-hmm. artists where you know they get it's like that. They get back from the road and they they're actually kind of depressed when they get back home because they're like the, the the touring life is their is their bread and butter. But uh, how, how does it work? For yes. You? I do. I feel that I know. And like some, I was thinking that too. I was like, Billy Nelson, like he's on the road, like all the time. Like he lives in his Prevo. He's mm-hmm. got, he just lives in it, but that, you know, he might, he, that that's his life. And I can understand that like being home is, you know, you do, you are a little bit like, you know, you're a little bit walking around your backyard, like, all right, what's up? Where are the fans? You know, <laughs> <laughs> come on, where's my applause? You know? And like, you know, like my long suffering paramour chill, like he can only like tell me I'm great so much, right? So it's just like he's or my dogs are over it. But you know, so a little bit you're like, Oh well, whatever, back to the real world and I'm mowing my lawn, you know, with my push mower. But um, you know, luckily I love home, so I'm a homebody, so luckily it works out for me too. But yeah, I can understand why some of these artists that do basically live on the road, it's yeah. depressing for them to be home. You know, it- I saw an interview with Kirk Hammett of Metallica it, back when they were doing that, that two-year run on the Black Album. When, he, oh they, my God. when, when they finally got home and, and he got settled into his house, he woke up one yeah. morning and he said, well, you know, what's next? What do I do with myself? It, it, you know, back, I yeah. guess, maybe when Belly in the 90s, when you were doing those longer tour runs, did you ever kind of have that, if, that that coming home off the, a long tour? I mean, obviously not the two yeah. years, but did you ever have like, what do I, what am I supposed to do with myself moment? Did you have that? Yeah, we could kind of see, I could see that too, because you really just get ingrained to like, you know, like your life is basically run by other people and it's usually your tour manager or, you know, from beyond that, the label and your management, but you know, you're living all for you're living for the lobby call you know like all you have to do is just like what time is lobby call you mm. know what i mean <laughs> and you really don't have to really think so much for yourself and you kind of get into that routine and um you know it is fun it's exhilarating it's exhilarating to play to everyone says this but it's exhilarating to play to people who love your music and know your music every night like i really don't know of any profession other than the performing arts where you get that immediate kind of ego biscuit gratification (laughs) and it's an, it's intoxicating, right? You know, it's like, you know, you really, you want to deliver the song and you want to deliver the performance, but you're also like feeding off. I mean, everybody says it, it's nothing, it's nothing new, but you know, and that, that is intoxicating. And then there is withdrawal from that when, when that's over and, you know, I, you know, you're back to just, you know, mowing your lawn or whatever. But. <laughs> I get it. Well, you joined Belly yeah. in uh, 1993 uh, for the uh, the King album. Uh, and then there, you, yep. you kind of talked about the long break of uh, till 2018's uh, Dove. Uh, talk a little bit about that rejuvenation of getting the band back together and getting back in the studio again. Oh, it, it was amazing. I think it was like around 2015. We had sort of started like sending a little couple of emails back and forth. I had really been in touch with uh, Tanya throughout um, our whole hiatus. I hadn't really seen Chris and Tom very much. Um, although it's funny, I was friends with their parents because we live in the same town and we fight sprawl together and we protect yeah. open space in our town. Um, so we're eco warriors and, um, and and so I love his parents, Chris and, and Tom Sr., um, their parents. But um, so we kind of just started sending emails back and forth and just like, you know, hey, what do you know? What do you think? You know, want to want to try it and uh, see how it is. And so we practice at my house uh, in Rhode Island and we call it the Rock and Roll Control Center. All, <laughs> any band I've ever been in, my, including my other band, Benny Sizzler, rehearses down in the basement. And um, they just... They basically were like, let's just see what happens. So they came over one day and we picked up right where we had left off. The same jokes. Um, we were rusty with playing and stuff, but the personalities, like when we were really at our high point, getting along the best was just like, you know, we have the four, the four of us share stories that nobody else can share. Like if you mention a certain tour manager that wore like tight bike shorts and he didn't wear underwear and we called it we called it the fruit bowl you know what i mean like they no nobody else in the world would understand what the four of us had as a connection and and that was really wonderful and everybody was grown up and everyone 
had lived lives and had loves and losses. And, um, you know, we weren't douchebag, you know, 20 somethings anymore, <laughs> although I'm older than everybody. So, you know, I was I, I wasn't a douchebag 30 something anymore. You know, I was a douchebag 50 something. <laughs> 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 but no, it was really wonderful. In 2016, we had no idea. And um, we announced that we were going to go on tour and um, we sold out every place and we played in the UK and, um, um, dates in, in the U S and it was just amazing. Oh, so cool. As far as cool. you guys getting together in, in, in rehearsing and in, in planning a, a set list for a, a, a tour run, um, how do you, how do you guys decide what, what, what tracks you're going to use and, and, and how, I guess, just give us, is it a diplomatic process when it comes to, uh, hey, we're going to play these songs or, hey, we have these in our hip pocket too. And I, I guess, give, yeah. our, give our listeners the story behind of creating a belly set list. Well, I, um, I just play whatever they tell me to play. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am the worst person for crafting a set list a set list like I like you know bringing people up and then bringing them down like I just am like that kind of like um orchestration to like um make a set list flow so that the audience goes along for the ride is just not my forte Tom Gorman is fantastic for doing that so um I tend to just let Tom say hey what do you you know what do you think and Tanya and Tom usually come up with it. And then Chris and I will have something to say, like, oh, well, my favorite song is blank and we're not actually doing that. And that will try to fit it in. But um, I, I definitely let those guys write the set. Um, the, we did a longer set when we were headlining on the East Coast and playing with the Parkingtons because uh, they actually played six songs with us. So mm-hmm. um, and we picked ones that we wanted to be epic and that they could elevate with um, strings. Mm-hmm. And um, so we had more songs that, but it was really weird actually. We had to because we had to only play ten songs opening for the Breeders. And again, you know, head up the ass douchebaggery. We hadn't <laughs> had to play a short set like that in a long time, so that was an interesting exercise too. So we had to stick to the hits basically, you know, yeah. um, oh, you know whatever our hits are or whatever you would consider a hit, but the ones that most people know are the ones we had to really kind of stick to. We couldn't really take them on the epic journey that we did when we, yeah. we played yeah, on the East Coast. <laughs> it was kind of like wham, bam, thank you, man. And it was actually like every song was fast, and I was a little bit gassed and kind of dying. I'm like, don't we have a fucking ballad in here <laughs> where the old lady can fucking take a break? But um, it was uh, it was pretty exhilarating. All, all the songs were rockers, and it, it was really fun. Awesome. But um, yeah. yeah, very good. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to approach this one. So um, I know on that tour, on that um, you, you know, right before you guys went on tour, you you had diagnosed with cancer, I believe, and mm-hmm. uh, you you had a little run with that. Uh, how did is, is that something you're comfortable with talking about? I, I, oh yeah, I got no, family absolutely. members right now that are dealing with that. So um, oh no, I'm sorry. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Fuck cancer. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They're dealing with that. I. I. I like to tell my story because I think to some degree it's kind of um, uplifting and a positive yeah. way to talk about like getting treatment. I mean, I, I mean, I'm lucky because I was able to, I was diagnosed with um, uterine cancer. Uh, let's see, we got back together again in yeah, 2016 and we were all set to go on the road and go to the first dates were in the UK and um I was diagnosed. I I I was diagnosed with uterine cancer, and I I didn't tell the band about it. Didn't tell anyone about it because I went and got a, a DNC, and then I got um I had a biopsy, and uh it came back that it had metastasized to a fallopian tube, and I went oh fuck you know like I kind of thought I could just have a hysterectomy and be one and done, and mm-hmm. I wouldn't even really have to tell anybody about it, right? But since it had uh, metastasized, I needed to get treatment, which in my case was chemotherapy. So um, that was something I had to break to the band. And it was like devastating. I mean, we had been rehearsing for months and, you know, we hadn't played together in 25 years. And here I was going to have to get shut down. Um, They 
my team here at Women and Infants in Rhode Island were absolutely fantastic. They they knew my situation. They knew I was a musician getting ready to go on tour. And um, they got me in right away. I hope I didn't jump the line for somebody that really needed the surgery faster than I did. But um, I was treated expedited. I was expedited surgery. And then six weeks later, um, after recovering from my hysterectomy, I was able to tour the UK and we did two weeks in the UK. And then the, I knew the minute I landed back in Boston, um, the last night was in Ireland and I knew in 12 hours I would actually be sitting in an infusion chair in, in Rhode Island getting my um, first chemo treatment. Mm. So we really didn't know how that was going to go. We had a couple weeks off before we went and did our U.S. dates. We had like a, a month in the U.S. And um, I, I'm here to say it was it was actually amazing. Chemotherapy is uh, the, the type of chemo that I had, which was uh, I think it was Taxol and Carboplatin. Um, I was able to tour on it. I mean, I was losing my hair and that was depressing and sad, but I was felt enough that I could get my treatment. And then you feel shitty for like, I don't know, like five, seven days. But then it seemed like it just worked out the way they gave me my treatment every three weeks that then the tour, the dates for the next cities were coming up. And um, I kind of feel shitty, like fly into the city. But once I got on stage, I felt fantastic. So I'm kind of like here to tell people that, you know, it's not the end of the world. Chemotherapy is is um, really a great tried and true gold standard um cancer treatment and um you can survive it and you lose your hair and it sucks but i had wonderful friends that had chemo before me my my friend biff naked um Mm -hmm. is a cancer survivor and you know she would give me great advice on how to keep a wig on while you're head banging you know what i mean (laughs) yeah (laughs) like like stuff like that and um so i had really great friends and some and actually another friend in a band i got i'm she wants to remain private, but told me about um, her treatment while she was still playing shows. And, and it can be done. And I'm here to tell you that it can be done. And um, uh, another reason I can't, I, I would have kept it quiet. And even, I, even though no one mentioned, obviously, it looked like I think I was wearing a wig. I think no one, everyone was so polite. No one said anything about it. And my band was phenomenal. Like, I didn't even know half the stuff that my band, Belly, was doing. Yeah. You know, they were like, turning down press requests and they were trying to keep my schedule, you know, really doable. Hotels were like right next to the venue so that I could sound check and go right back to the hotel and then show up on stage. And, you know, Tanya arranged all the travel and uh, they, you know, they were just so fucking great. I couldn't have asked for, for, for better understanding, but it also just, just to get political, political for a second. um, You know, I wanted to come out in support of the ACA because that was under attack in 2016 and they were trying to uh, uh, Republicans were trying to repeal the ACA. And I am on Obamacare and I'm a proud recipient of um, the Affordable Care Act. And I've actually had cancer twice and it has saved my life twice. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to um, come out in support of that and to do that, to put my own personal story out there um, to try to help us. save the affordable care act and so um and again the next step is medicare for all for all my friends mm-hmm. but for now this is a good step towards that so i'm i'm very thankful that um that the aca exists yeah thank you for sharing you are a true inspiration gail well i hope i hope your family members will be fine and i i mean obviously every single person is every every case is different but yeah. um you know, I'm a breast cancer and a uterine cancer survivor. Knock on wood, you know, I'm, I appear to be in remission right now. And um, uh, I, I'm also a skin cancer survivor. But I just like, um, fuck, man, we can do it. They can do it. And I just send them all my positive vibes, all your loved ones. I send them all my positive vibes that they're going to have a complete recovery. Thank you. My brother just recovered from uh, germ cell testicular cancer last year, and uh, you know, oh my god! And yeah, and wow! He, and it was uh, he went through a, a hell yeah. for about nine months, but you oh. you'd never know it now. Yeah. Yeah. So, but hey, let's oh, go. Oh, isn't that amazing? It okay, is wonderful. It is okay. Yep. Let's go on to more brighter things here. So yeah, brighter. Yeah. <laughs> let's lighten it up a little. Bit. Absolutely. So. Belly is also working on new material. Can you talk a little bit more about, I guess, the new 
hopefully album on the horizon from Belly? Yeah, well, d- you know, during the pandemic, you know, we'd all been writing and um, I write all the time. Tom writes all the time. Tanya writes all the time. So I had a million riffs. Um, and Tanya and I actually put out a couple of songs. She did like a pandemic series. And so she and I put out um, a couple of songs and and then we had just been writing other stuff. And then Tom had been writing stuff. And we we're like, hey, what do you guys think about like, it looks like we have enough material for like another belly record. So we have about, I don't know, we have like 12 songs. We played uh, three new ones on this last tour on the East Coast. Um, and um, they were really well received. So nice. I, you know, I think our fans are, um, they're super friends. They're actually our super friends, I should call them. And they're mm. very supportive and ready for new material. Our task is to try to find a four letter name because that seems to be how it's gone star yeah. king dove so if you yeah. guys have any suggestions you guys are creative creative geniuses so if you can come up with a four letter name for this next record and it's the fourth record it probably should be four but it should be <laughs> listen i don't know i don't yeah. know <laughs> very good so that'll be interesting yeah well, yeah, you, um, I think in your bio you talked about the Newport Music Festival in Rhode Island. Um, is that something you guys are planning here in the near future? Well, listen, I'll tell you. It, it was um, We just did our, we played at Fort Adams in okay. Newport, Rhode Island, which is a 19th century maritime fort. And it was uh, it's famous because it, it houses the um, Newport Jazz Festival oh, and the cool. Newport Folk Festival, which are obviously world renowned. Yeah, and they attract like twenty thousand people a year. That's in the summer, and um, they sell out before people even know who the acts are. Mm. So uh, a friend of ours is in development at the fort now, um, Bob Kendall, and he asked us, you know, how would Belly feel about doing your first show back in five years at Fort Adams, and it would be a fundraiser for the fort because it's a state park and um we were like oh that is so freaking cool yeah. i we would love to do that because the fort is a really magical place and uh, it's so quintessential newport and um so we that was our, actually our first show before we started our east coast tour and um we sold it out and uh we played with the parkington sisters and a friend of ours craig jordan and um it this is going to sound really sappy, but it was so beautiful. It was kind of like a high school reunion. It was everybody you knew because it was our local. That's our hometown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone you knew from every era of your life. And it was a little bit worlds collide. Like, I'm, you know, I'm a graphic designer daytime. And so some of my clients were there and I was like, eh, I don't know if they know I swear as much as I do. <laughs> And then they see me on stage and I was like, we might have lost a few clients, but people were so, so beautiful and so wonderful. People came from all over to come to this show and you could bring a lawn chair and there was a sunset. So it went so well and we made a lot of money for the fort that I'm hoping, and this is what we're talking about, is that we might be able to turn it into an annual, like our own festival to rival maybe not rival the jazz and the folk obviously but we could be the alternative rock version Mm. of those festivals and um we between all of us in the band we have so many friends and so many other bands and even bands i've played with in the past that would come and play it with us and we could turn it into something so that's that's what we're kind of hoping to do and have it be in the fall the the newport and folk and jazz are in the summer but ours would be like in the fall so hopefully that will work out. Yeah, with the festival, something like that, where you're, you're so acquainted with your audience, is it something where the band goes out and mingles with the crowd before and after the show? Yeah, like it's we, yeah, and it was, we just knew so many people there. It's funny, they had the green room was in like the barracks where, like, I guess like in, you know, in the 19th century, that was where like, you know, the soldiers slept, but they turned it into a green room and it was really cool. And it's a really cool old fort. So just basically everybody we ever knew in our whole lives was back there. And, uh, and it was just, it was really neat. Yeah. We totally, totally mingled. No, we knew everybody. Um, uh, it's crazy. It was kind of the most nerve wracking show just because you knew so many people. So personally, like my whole family came, like my family doesn't usually go to a lot of the shows, but like everybody I knew, nieces and nephews, young nephews, um, 
said they loved it. You know, they had like, they really loved it. I'm like, are you fucking high? Cause like, this is so <laughs> like, I'm like your boomer aunt. And really just, <laughs> I'm like, really? But they were so ecstatic. They static. They loved it. So yeah, I don't know if they're pulling my leg or not, but we, we seem to, Hey, we seem to kill, I guess I should say. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you got the next one? Yeah, well, coming up in January, Joey, uh, Joey's song Epilepsy Research Benefit, I uh, believe in Madison, yes. Wisconsin. That's when you're uh, prom- got upcoming next? Yes, that is so great. I don't know if you know um, that Joey's song is um, it, it's an epilepsy benefit for um, the epilepsy research. Mm. And Mike Gamal, who lost his son, Joey, to epilepsy. Um, when he was five years old, founded this organization. And they've had, they've been, I think this might be their 13th year. So it's held in Madison, Wisconsin. And it's, um, Butch Vig is a big part of it. He's an old college friend of Mike Gamal, the founder. And so um, they do this benefit concert every year. And last year, um, Kay Hanley was asked to do it. And then K from Letters to Cleo, and then Kay asked Tanya if she wanted to do it with her, and then Tanya asked me if I wanted to go out and do it too. So we went out and did like a kind of like a um, Frankenstein, it was half Letters to Cleo, half Belly <laughs> um, set, and it, it was really fun. It was it was just the, just the girls that flew out, um, and um, it went so well, I think, I think, that and also like we kind of broke up the sausage party because it's usually <laughs> lots of men yeah. and uh, and Mike and Butch Vig who run he's, his house band is called the Know It All Boyfriends and they're amazing they have Chris Collingwood of Fountains of Wayne they've got Duke mm. from Garbage mm-hmm. they've got um, uh, Free Johnston um, uh, Dave Perner from Soul Asylum sits in with them nice. um, they have an amazing band I think we gave them the idea to like. Um, bring more women in and so we are going to be and they're called the know-it-all boyfriends we are doing an epic battle of the bands and i'm actually the musical director for the know-it-all girlfriends nice nice. <laughs> so and there's actually a heavyweight belt like mike actually went out and had a heavyweight belt made it's like this giant like mma belt like and so the winner of the battle is we're each going to play five songs um our band is comprised of check out who's in our band. We've got um, Dickie and Debbie Peterson from the Bangles. Oh, wow. Yeah. Gina Volpe from the Lunachicks, mm. an old punk rock friend of mine from back in the day. My old uh, band Boneyard and Lunachicks used to play together all the time. Kay Hanley. Um, uh, oh, Nikki Moninger from Silver Sun Pickups. Mm. Linda Pittman from Zuzu's Pedals and the Baseball Project. Um, uh, Laura Jane Grace, uh, Ella Feingold, who played, has a Grammy from just playing on the Silk Sonic record. She's an amazing funk guitarist, funk rhythm guitarist. Um, Kelly Stewart, uh, Sierra Swan. Um, our, our band is going to be really hard to beat. <laughs> Sounds and like it. Yeah. They, they have, they have like, you know, Dave Perner, they've got um, Chris Collingwood, they've got, um, uh, Portugal the Man playing with them. They've got Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. Um, I mean, they're really going to be hard to beat, but I think we're going to be hard to beat too. So this is this is part of it. The whole night is great. It's lots of different bands that play, but this is going to be the featured performance, and we're each going to play five songs, and there's like a, a giant spin the wheel, and it lands on like a um, a genre, you know? Okay. Like that acid trip is genre. <laughs> and then... We'll do like some '60s number, and they'll do something. But um, so that that should be really fun. And yeah, again, exciting. it's a really great, a really great cause. So that's at the Sylvie Theater, January 6th in Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, so cool! Well, bringing this yeah, back, and it's really fun. Yeah, bringing yeah. this back to Belly. Uh, Belly's released nine EPs and three LPs since 1992. Uh, like I said, the how has the band's writing and recording process evolved and matured since those early beginnings, uh, especially since you've been in the band. Um, and, and I yeah. guess maybe if you take in consideration the, the big break you guys had, right? You know, 25 years, you said, um, yeah, yep, but, yep. <laughs> but it, if you, you take the time that you're in that big break and now, now you're writing new music again, 
Yeah, how has it changed? Has it has it evolved? Has it matured? Thoughts? Yeah, well, I um I think all of us write a little bit more, um, but also mostly the technology obviously has changed. As everybody knows, you know, you can do inc- incredible recording in your own home. You know, um, you know, I had Pro Tools for a while, so I was using my own Pro Tools. I've recently switched to Logic, just because um. I don't know. It's just more user friendly, but um, so we each have Logic at home and great microphones, and so I think the the change has been in the technology. And I know every band does it this way now too. And I'm sure, like mostly during the pandemic, that's how everybody recorded. And you just send tracks around, and then you sem- assemble them later. Like we use Paul Coldery, who did Radiohead, and um, Cole. Um, he's a friend of ours. He um, produced and engineered our last record dove so he kind of pulled it all together for us sonically and that was really amazing so i think i guess i would say the change is just basically the technology or we'll get together hopefully we might even actually play live together probably maybe even my basement you know the rock and roll control center i don't know how we're going to do the basic tracks but hopefully that's how we're going to do that yeah, very good, Jeff. You got the next one. Well, yeah, I want to hear more about Benny Sizzler. Your, you, you said your house band or or your your. Oh yeah. With a chill mat. Yeah, yeah. He's my um. He's my long suffering paramour. <laughs> We've been happily unmarried yeah. for thirty five years. This poor kid. He's fucking amazing. He's a great painter. Check him out. Chillmot dot com. But he and I have been in this band for oh like twenty five years. It's like our forever band. And uh, we've got Slim Jim Collarin and Mark Thomas, these two Newport kids that are just fucking ringers. Great guitar player, great drummer. And um, we play um, it, whenever we can. We just we have the best time. We have like a huge local following that is always hungering for us to play out. But, um, you know, usually I'm doing a belly thing or or the pandemic fucked us over. But um, <laughs> we did just we just did a video. Um, and uh, uh, you got to check it out. It's uh, the song is called "So Much for Today," and um, we shot it on this rock out in the middle of the ocean. And we had to get there. Uh, my friend has a fishing boat, and we had to bring our back line out there. And it was a really crazy, like uh, I don't know, the high seas and this is totally Rhode Island. And uh, it's a drone video. My my brother's actually a commercial airline pilot. Uh, he's an Airbus captain, and he. Um, flew the drone and it's sick it's so great you got to check out this nice. video i can't even explain it but um yeah that's my forever band and i i just love benny Sozer and it's metal we call it basement metal yeah. um because that's my guilty pleasure is you know i'm an old 80s metal head so um you know that's uh that's kind of the that genre he uh, chills an old punk rocker, but I'm an old metalhead, so yeah. it's an interesting combination <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes it is uh as far as technology goes it is you know, it's so accessible for anybody to have this technology at home now. And we're seeing artists, I'm not going to call them musicians, creating music in their own home, but they they can't play an instrument, but they can press a button on a computer and they are generating music and they're, 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 uh, they're like, you know, I guess maybe big hits on, on, for, for young people on all the different types yeah. of social media. Is that good for the rock and roll industry to have this technology because we're having people that are making music that really should not be making music. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I, I know. Like, I think though, there's like, there's like a commodity, like there's always an audience for a product like that, you know? And I think like some people may be not as pure as you and I are and you, you and Jeff and Eric and I, that would think like, you know, like I really want to hear a real guitar, right. you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that there's a market for that and probably dance music has always been that way since, you know, for the last 40 years, I'm sure that that's sort of been created that way too. And people still get excited and get off on it. Um, You know, it's not necessarily for me, but I can't really say whether it's good or bad, but um, uh, you still have to craft something that gets people to move. So even if you are just doing it on a computer, you still have to, again, to be to sound like a douchebag, sort of take them on a journey somehow. And some people are able to do that via the computer. And so that, to some degree, is still has a certain amount of creativity to it. So 
I kind of got to give those guys credit a little bit. Yeah, so be it. I, I still want to go see a four-piece rock band, though. I mean, that's me. When I go see a show, that's what I want to see. I want to see a four-piece rock band. Absolutely. You know? Uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit more. You kind of alluded to your art illustrator yeah. degree. Um, can you talk a little bit about that uh, that business that you have? Yes. I my, my, my dad and mom were artists, and uh, they went to the Rhode Island School of Design and met there and graduated in the 50s. And then my dad started a... Greenwood Associates Design, right. and he um, was a graphic designer for a number of years, and my sister Betsy um, took over the company when my dad retired, and then sadly my sister passed away of breast cancer mm -hmm. in 2003, um, thank you, And um, but Chill had been working with her uh, while I was on the road with Belly, actually, so um, he was helping her, and then um, when when Belly broke up, it was just sort of natural for me to get into graphic design as an illustrator who graduated from RISD myself with a degree in illustration and actually taught drawing at Mass College of Art right before I joined Belly. It was it was so nice. weird. I was headed toward teaching and then yeah. I I became a douchebag bass player. <laughs> so um, douchebag is the word of the night, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you made the right decision. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of think I did. I'm sorry. I actually had some of my students when Belly actually then had a single on the radio, um, you know, and got kind of big. Um, some of my students were coming to shows and it was it was talk about when worlds collide. It was just very strange, <laughs> um, but it was super fun. So um yeah, so we're still, still, I would say, like, day job is we're still graphic designers, although transitioning more into, um, Chill's getting into painting, um, and um, he's a fa fabulous painter, and I, I still illustrate, and, um, you know, so we, it's, it's in our blood, creativity, music, and art are really kind of, some, you know, yeah. um, very close, and so we just, you know, can't not create terrible because the problem is like when you create a lot of shit then you have like a lot of shit around your house and you're just like oh, no. yeah. and we have slight kind of hoard hoarding properties that we have to kind of deal with so um anyway when you create music it's just kind of hidden on a flash drive no one sees it but when you create art you're like oh shit i got all this shit around you now. Yeah. but um yeah, so that that is uh yeah, that that is my day job is uh, is visual art. So, I'm I'm very lucky that I have a creative day job that I'm not hauling sheetrock or something <laughs> like that. Very much so. Can you talk just a little bit about your brief time with L7? Oh my god. The funniest time of my life. I just I am like actually laughing right now thinking about it. I can't <laughs> stop. I never laughed so hard as when I was in L7 for three years, where I had replaced Jennifer Finch, who had yeah. left. Um, she is back in the fold in her rightful place because she is fucking phenomenal. Um, but I, it was an honor of a lifetime. And you talk about like phone calls you'll never forget yeah. is when I got a phone call from Danita Sparks asking me if, if I wanted to audition for the band. And I think I saved it. It's on like an answering machine tape. <laughs> yeah. And I know it's around somewhere, but it, it was the thrill of a lifetime to. A, meet them, audition for them, and then get the gig, and then tour with them for three years. I have never felt like, when you took a stage with L7, and this is, I've seen them, you know, I just saw them a couple of months ago. Um, there's just something so powerful about that band, um, to see them, but then to actually be in the band, it's just like, you just felt like you you were just, you, you could do no wrong. They were the most powerful live band ever. And they still are. I'm happy to announce again because I just saw them. But to be actually be in, be part of that power was one of the most amazing feelings I've ever experienced in my life. Oh, nice. so cool. Super great crunchy guitar yeah. sounds, super heavy. My kind of music, you know, a little metal, a little punk, just mm -hmm. like great, hilarious lyrics. And then traveling with them, they are just the fucking funniest girls you would ever me like crying laugh like always crying and i uh, i felt like i met my tribe when i went out west and um because i was a Rhode island girl and i had to you know go to the west coast and um to travel with them and really the greatest one of the one of the greatest live bands in the world today mm. and i think i think a lot of people would agree they just finished the south american tour which is nuts i've been watching them online and just like 
And, and it's it's actually really funny. I was just like, uh, this is just like off topic, but Dee Plack is the drummer and I are, are really close. And we were just like um, talking about, uh, she, I guess I we were both on the road and I was like, yeah, I'm in my bed eating the rider. Like, that's what I do. Like, I take the rider home with me at night and eat it in my hotel room. And she's like, oh, my God, I'm in my bed and uh, we're in Arizona eating the rider. You know, <laughs> it's just like. You know, just like so many similarities between us, and it's just, uh, oh, God, I love them. Again, you're going to have to edit this because I told you I don't shut the F up. <laughs> but um, one, one of the good. best times of my life. Love them. Love them. Uh, all right. We got one last question for you, and we'll leave you alone for the evening. Deal? Okay. I'm right. enjoying talking to you. This has been a blast. Um, so the the mystery of rock and roll, it, it, there's, it's no longer a thing with the Internet and all the social medias. Everybody knows everything about Anybody and everybody. Um, there is no Kiss. There is no Zeppelin. There is no Plasmatics anymore. Sure. For you, the artist and the fan, um, where's, your, where's your head at? Do you prefer this new age of accessibility? Because we didn't have the internet. We wouldn't be doing this with you right now. Or do you miss that mystique and mystery of rock and roll? Well, I love that you asked this of all your guests. I think it's a really great question. So it gave me a time to, I, I kind of got a chance to think about it a little bit. Ah, okay. So I could have like a more succinct answer. Okay. Um, and so I think uh, uh, back in the day when I was in my punk rock band, Boneyard, like you would live for like getting a blurb and like flip side or maximum rock and roll, mm, right? Yeah. You'd go to your local news break and you'd look for the fanzines and like, that had a certain magic, right? It was in print. It was. Um, but not as many people got to know about you um, that way. And it was a lot of it was word of mouth. Like my old band used to do lots of shows with bands that came through of social distortion, circle jerks, bad brains. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we became very good friends with the Goo Goo Dolls. They used to be a three piece, you know, punk rock band. Yeah. And we toured with them a lot. So some of that mystery of gathering fans just from touring um and getting your word and your name out and just like going to a lot of different cities you know we played up in buffalo all the time was really cool on the other hand the magic of the internet unfortunately i mean it's inundated i mean it's like it's really like you know find the pope and the pizza because there's just <laughs> so much information to try to break through it's a little harder but if you and you can, you know, your audience that you can reach is infinitesimal, really. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to think back at like some of the magic and mystery of the older bands. Like, you know, you do wonder about like the brown M and M's, the TVs <laughs> getting thrown in the pool. You know, mm -hmm. like Van Halen or yeah. Led Zeppelin. Were those stories that were just created by management and they just like kind of became urban myths? You know, like yes. did those yeah. things really even happen? And um, so. You know, I'm not sure whether, you know, those stories, those are just kind of cool urban myths that really were never actual realities. But, you know, it's still fun to think that that maybe did happen. Right. But again, we wouldn't be doing this today if we didn't have, um, you know, the Internet. And this is a really great chance for uh, me to get the word of belly out and Denny Sizzler out um, to more to more listeners. So, I mean, that's really cool, too. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, um, we're out of our allotted time for the evening. Is there anything that we left off that you would like to plug or promote? No, I think we covered just about everything. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry to say, including the kitchen sink, as far as my end, but I just I think you guys are great for doing this. I think it's a lot of work to put out a podcast once a week, and I just love that you're doing as many different people as you can it's really fun to go through your archives and listen back to all of your podcasts i'm really enjoying it i'm really glad Thank i got you. to meet you guys this has been fantastic yeah. so this is how things are going to work out um we're about two weeks behind on our episodes but once yours is ready jeff the editing wizard over here and he is the best <laughs> he is the best in the midwest awesome Jeff. Um, we'll send it to you yes. and, and, and please share it wherever you possibly can and we'll do the same thing so yes, good. I absolutely will. Really great talking to you guys. Yeah, thank I you hope so to much. meet you in real life someday. Yeah, absolutely. Gail, thank you so much. Yes, thanks for coming on. All right, All right one last thank question. Thank you, Jeff and Eric. One yeah, last okay. question for you before I let you go. <laughs> you got to do me a huge favor, okay? Yes. 
I've been trying to get Tanya on this podcast for the last two years. Can you tell oh, her? Fuck yes. Can, can you tell her she how cool we are? She did it. She told. She actually told me she did it. No, we had so Kristen think, on. Yeah, that was it. Okay, listen. I will absolutely tell her that you guys are very rad and very cool, awesome human beings, and she would love to do it. I'm. I'm positive. Well, thank you so yeah, much. We you. appreciate it. All right. All right. I'm going well, to I'm I'm text her right now. You've, oh, been, fan- you good. you've been fantastic. We appreciate it. Thank you <laughs> so right. much. Yeah, thank you. All right. Take thank care. you, guys. Have a good night. I'll talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah.
Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts.